morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to begin by acknowledging John Howard, Professor Tom Frame, Professor David Lovell, and Andrew Blythe, the convener of this conference. As someone who covered the Howard government, the entire Howard government at close quarters, I'm delighted to be able to speak to the conference this morning. The theme is crisis management under the Howard government. I've completed a longer paper on this subject and will present an edited version of that paper this morning. <clears throat> I begin with three overarching propositions. No government can succeed in the contemporary era without a capability in crisis management. If you don't possess this, you fail. We live in an age of mounting crisis. Just in the last few years alone, we've had a global pandemic, a global and domestic recession, energy policy attrition, and geostrategic crisis centered around China and Russia. Crisis is occurring more frequently in today's world, and that won't change. Most crises, not all, but most, cannot be predicted. And there is no fixed rule book to manage a crisis. Each crisis is different. This is not like the annual budget process. There is no natural generic response. Crisis management demands innovation, flexibility and judgment, since each crisis is unique. Now, these three propositions govern my remarks today. The nature of crisis varies in severity, origin and subject. A crisis can be short or protracted. Our sense of crisis is defined by our age. The wartime tribulations of John Curtin cast crisis in a very different frame to those faced by John Howard. In my view, however, there are two common features that define a crisis, and those run through my remarks today. Crisis, I think, reveals the true character of a leader and of a prime minister. A crisis is an event beyond the ordinary. It calls forth a deeper, more elemental response, a response that exposes the leader's heart, perhaps the leader's political soul, and under pressure, the leader's flaws. When much of the mundane business of government decision-making is forgotten, history recollects the moments of crisis because those moments define the Prime Minister's character. And secondly, a crisis is invariably a test of governing ability. I've long argued that our system is best understood as a model of prime ministerial government. Its faces change from Gough Whitlam to Scott Morrison to Anthony Albanese, but prime ministerial government is the central organising principle. In 2009, I argued that Howard built a structure of prime ministerial government that gave him more power than his Liberal predecessors Sir Robert Menzies or Malcolm Fraser. A crisis tests the capacity of a Prime Minister to mobilise the necessary elements at his disposal in the executive or the parliament or his outreach to foreign leaders and invariably it tests the leader's relations with the public, the ability to persuade and to, and to explain. A crisis typically tests the leader's standing with the people. It is in a crisis that prime ministerial government faces its supreme challenge. In my remarks today, I adopt a broad interpretation of crisis, not a narrow interpretation, <clears throat> because I want to examine the Howard government in the variety of critical situations it faced. <clears throat> I don't want to be constrained by academic debate about what exactly constitutes a crisis. The crises I deal with in my paper are gun laws, the waterfront dispute, the East Timor intervention, the Tampa, 9-11 and its aftermath in Afghanistan, the Iraq commitment and finally the Bali bombing. I probably won't get to all of them in my presentation this morning. I could, however, have easily looked beyond these because other events had an element of crisis. For instance, the consequence of the High Court WIC decision, the Commonwealth's intervention 
to take over Indigenous affairs in the Northern Territory. The shock to the economy in early 2001 from rising interest rates, a negative growth quarter and falling currency, or the drama-filled week in September 2007 when John Howard asked Alexander Downer to sound out the Cabinet on his possible resignation as Prime Minister. The technique I adopt in my paper this morning is to look at each crisis and draw lessons from the crisis. The first crisis coming within weeks of John Howard assuming office was the Port Arthur massacre that saw 35 people killed in the use of semi-automatic weapons. The nation was shocked, an emotional memorial service was conducted at Hobart. The Prime Minister responded quickly and with a firm position. He wanted to impose tough gun laws, including on ownership, sale and importation of semi-automatics, along with a gun buyback scheme. The Prime Minister ran into significant opposition from farm and rural sectors, from influential parts of the National Party and from some states, and the support of the states was essential. John Howard had to negotiate the politics through his own side. The Prime Minister's response reflects two principles of crisis that I have identified. His action was based on conviction. Before becoming Prime Minister, Howard had publicly supported tighter gun laws. His observation of America's gun culture and its consequences had only sharpened his belief in the opposing vision for Australia. Without Prime Ministerial conviction, this change would not have happened. It's also an example of governing authority. Coalition relations and the support of the Nationals was vital. But Howard had also been prepared to take the issue to a constitutional referendum if required. It wasn't. The crisis, I think, also reflected another aspect of John Howard. On this issue, he rejected individual rights in favour of the social order, a reoccurring feature of his philosophy as Prime Minister. A different but critical event for the Howard government was the 1998 showdown on the waterfront, triggered not really by a surprise event, but by government policy. Howard was elected on an agenda to make the waterfront internationally competitive, and that meant breaking the monopoly power of the Maritime Union of Australia, the MUA. He described the resulting crisis as the most bitterly fought domestic issue of my whole time as Prime Minister. It was marked by violence and deep and bitter emotions. At an early stage, Howard and Industrial Relations Minister Peter Reith realised that reform would likely trigger a confrontation. A necessary condition was an employer willing to fight, and Chris Corrigan, boss of Patrick Stevedoring Company, was that employer. Corrigan's assumption was that a trained non-union alternative workforce was essential and the MUA would never tolerate that. Howard told Corrigan the government would back his campaign with one condition, that it comply with Australian law. But Howard's dilemma was that the government was not in full control. It was hostage to Corrigan. In 1997, Corrigan dismissed his unionised workforce, put baklava clad security guards with dogs onto the dock. The MUA was locked out. It was a public relations disaster for Corrigan and Reith. Most media favoured the union. Scenes of violence and chaos dominated on television. Strong picket lines were set up to intimidate the non-union workforce. In the end, the MUA's power was broken. The union lost half its workforce. Many efficiencies were introduced. Corrigan got a viable business. And John Howard branded the waterfront reform one of the great achievements of the government. Peter Reith was seriously damaged. He was a casualty. In a conversation with Howard at the peak of the crisis, Reith, given the damaging situation facing the government, 
offered to resign, an offer Howard would not countenance. He believed losing Reith would have sent a devastating signal of political failure. The key to the waterfront crisis was the determination of the Prime Minister to prosecute the cause of reform. But this was a different sort of crisis. Ultimately, it was a policy-driven crisis. Howard and Reith ran very significant risks, political and legal. For much of the time, opinion was against them. The outcome was in no way ordained from the start and the risks were substantial. I make in conclusion the observation that one of the paradoxes, I think, of the Howard government lies in the two competing instincts of the Prime Minister, to be a force for stability and to be a change agent to reform national defects. The waterfront is a classic example of the second instinct. I have no hesitation in including on my crisis list the East Timor story. This was a transforming event for John Howard, the point at which he passed the threshold to become a national security leader. The crisis empowered Howard as a military and diplomatic prime minister. In September, 1999, acting under, the, uh, acting under the authority of a UN Security Council resolution, an international force was led by Australia and dispatched to East Timor to impose order on the province after its vote for independence from Indonesia in a national plebiscite. This was Australia's most vital military commitment since Vietnam. It followed slaughter, population relocation, and scorched earth tactics against East Timorese by local pro-Indonesian militia with support from the highest level of the Indonesian army. Intelligence suggested the risk of large-scale killings. Howard told UN Secretary General Kofi Annan that Australia would make a major troop commitment to the international forced contingent, but would insist on Australian leadership of the intervention. Annan agreed. Howard launched a, a diplomatic campaign to secure contributions from, from a range of nations. The key was obtaining the consent of the Jakarta government. The Clinton administration, initially slow to act, delivered high-level warnings to Indonesian President Abibi to help secure his acquiescence. But the Jakarta government was divided and there were real fears the Australian-led force would face a military resistance. The Australian commander, Major General Peter Cosgrove, told me he had expected perhaps scores of Australian casualties. Visiting the troops in Townsville, before the departure, John Howard was conscious that some of the young men he was talking to might face an early death. This was an unprecedented moment in Howard's Prime Ministership. For the first time, he was putting Australian lives at risk. The opening days of the deployment were among the most dangerous of Howard's time as Prime Minister to that point. Indonesian troops in East and West Timor vastly outnumbered the size of the intervention force. If that force had been challenged, the consequences would have been dire. Cosgrove did a brilliant job in being both firm, yet working with the Indonesian military. The operation was a remarkable success. The East Timor crisis brought to a zenith, to that point, the operation of Cabinet's National Security Committee in managing security crises. At the height of the East Timor drama, the NSC met twice daily. Fundamental to its structure was having the selected few senior ministers meeting with the critical security, policy and military advisers. This decision-making process worked well on East Timor. It was later used in relation to Afghanistan and Iraq. I suggest the NFC as a decision-making instrumentality came to maturity in relation to the East Timor crisis. It was an efficient instrument for decision making, but it was also important in enhancing the power of the Prime Minister in security, defence and military issues. The NSC to this day 
remains the proven instrument of crisis management. The East Timor story was dominated by risk, unpredictability and changing goals. Again, it verifies my thesis about crisis. Howard's convictions were critical. And those convictions were that ultimately, Australia must support an independent East Timor and lead in delivering that transition. The Prime Minister also realised that while the decision to commit the ADF was a shared cabinet decision, his ministers instinctively left that final decision to me. If Howard had said no, his ministers would have accepted that. East Timor was the prelude to another but more prolonged phase in the Howard government and crisis management, an era of far-reaching disruption from August 2001 to late 2003. This was defined by a series of crises and their consequences that, while separate events had powerful connecting national security themes, the four standout events being the 2001 Tampa interception, the 9-11 attack on the United States, our military commitment to Afghanistan, the Bali bombing of October 2002, that saw 88 Australians killed, and finally, the March 2003 commitment to the Iraq war, with the devastating consequences as that invasion turned counterproductive. These events, I argue, transformed the Howard government. From the eve of the 2001 election campaign until well into its third term, the government, while conducting its economic and social decision-making tasks, was plunged into a series of shock national security and military responses that defined John Howard's character, polarised views about his government, ignited his supporters in ideological, in ideological conviction, but provoked a bitter campaign of moralistic hostility against him. Many of the most vivid, long-lasting and contentious memories of the Howard government come from this period. The government's response to these events while exercise in crisis management constitute a larger story of a government whose actual identity was framed by crisis and response to crisis. The dilemma raised by the Norwegian freight at Tampa would pivot on a clash of principles. The right of a democratic state to protect its borders and decide who becomes part of its community and the principle of universal human rights obligating rich nations to accept asylum seekers arriving on their doorstep. The Tampa became an opportunity for John Howard to confront the steady influx of boat arrivals to Australia over the previous three years. A range of policies had, be put, had been put in place, but the government was losing the battle with the people smugglers. Howard felt that to give landfall to Tampa was tantamount to an act of surrender. This is the reason he resorted to military force. He chose confrontation to uphold sovereignty. After the Tampa entered Australian waters, the government ordered the SAS to board and take control of the ship. It was a popular move, but filled with danger. What would happen to the asylum seekers? The government initially had no solution. Indonesia and Norway, at head of government level, had refused to help. At this point, taking a stand on principle, Howard had to mobilise the resources of government, legal, diplomatic and financial, to solve the deadlock he'd created. I believe there was a sense of desperation, almost panic within the government. Operating in uncharted territory, Howard took a number of decisions eventually leading to what we now know as the Pacific Solution and ensuring that the relocated Tampa asylum seekers did not land in Australia. The Tampa reflected some critical points about crisis. First, you must win in the courts. Unless you win in the courts, all is lost. Second, you need a core principle 
to sustain your case during the crisis, in this case, national sovereignty. Third, crisis invariably comes with great risks. Howard stopped the tamper before he really knew what to do with the asylum seekers. And fourth, if you come through, the political rewards can be high. This was a crisis with an enduring legacy. Howard's response resulted in the erection of a new set of legal, administrative, immigration and defence policies that would have previously been regarded as unacceptable. Australia's stance had regional and global ramifications. The Tampa was a crisis that changed Australia. It saw the implementation of a new border protection regime adopted by the political system and supported by the public, despite a strong dissenting minority denouncing the Prime Minister on moral grounds. Within days, another epic event had occurred. The Islamist attack on New York and Washington on the 11th of September 2001, when the Prime Minister was actually in the US Capitol. Declaring his support for our American friends, John Howard said, we will stand by them, we will help them. It was an instinctive response. The implication was unmistakable that Australia would participate if asked in any future military action by the United States. Howard did not have to make such a call. He did so deliberately. This is the origin of Australia's involvement in wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. At this moment, Howard was exercising a supreme leadership role. In making that commitment, I spoke for my government and the people of Australia, he said later. This was Howard claiming as Prime Minister his right to speak for the nation, mobilising a political authority that rose from the crisis itself. The significance of 9-11 is that Howard used the crisis to achieve goals he had long sought. This is the key to the 9-11 event. He used the crisis to achieve certain strategic objectives. Under President Bush and Prime Minister Howard, the United States alliance was deepened in its strategic, intelligence, defence operability and economic dimensions. The alliance was transformed on Howard's watch, and this is a permanent change. While Howard and George W. Bush bonded the day before 9-11, it was 9-11 that made them warriors in arms, and their partnership the most significant in the history of the alliance. Howard's commitment to Afghanistan had bipartisan support. Iraq was different. In my view, John Howard was always going to do Iraq. The Iraq invasion engaged Howard's core faiths. His belief in the US alliance as a two-way street, his view that the West faced a moment of epic challenge, and his conception of Australian responsibility. Yet he was tactical. Australia's military contribution was targeted and limited. We took no, we took no fatalities, fatalities in combat, and that was vital when Bush's intervention proved to be deeply counterproductive. We should not make the mistake about Iraq of looking in hindsight and underestimating the risks. The Prime Minister understood the risks. He knew that if Australia took significant casualties on such a politically contentious military commitment, then the price paid would be his Prime Ministership. His job was on the line with the Iraq decision. I won't go into uh, my discussion of the Bali bombing. I'll now sum up. In summary, I think the Howard government's dealings with crisis had a profound impact. Its legacy was long-lasting. It changed Australia. It was fundamental in shaping the character of the government and the Prime Minister. I was asked to nominate three failures of John Howard in this domain. The first and most serious I nominate was his refusal to seek a full strategic assessment of the implications of the invasion of Iraq to guide our decision. 
there should have been a proper assessment conducted by Australia of the prospects of Western intervention succeeding. Second, I think there was too much hubris surrounding the East Timor intervention. In an interview later, John Howard, while not using the words, endorsed the notion of Australia as a deputy sheriff and that damaging optic ran for years. Finally, on the waterfront, this might not be a failure, but more a consequence. Greg Combay ran the union campaign and he learnt so much. When work choices came along, Combay, as the trade union leader, was ready. It was the waterfront that seasoned Combay and ensured that when it came to work choices, he was able to win the public relations battle against the Howard government. And that was a decisive event. Thank you very much.